Uh, my name is Adrian Price from Menzies. Uh, welcome to the um, webinar on AI and machine learning, alternative title, The Rise of the Algorithm, uh, jointly presented by Menzies and Moore Barlow. Uh, we have a couple of guest speakers today as well, um, Andy Dolan and Mike Jenkins. So I'm going to um, start off with a general introduction about um, artificial intelligence, why the fuss, advantages and disadvantages, a quick sector look to show you some examples of a number of sectors. How do you approach putting AI into your business? Just a couple of minutes on that. And then Rob's gonna take over from me on the tax breaks. Then we're gonna hand over to Dorothy to talk about legal aspects. And then we've got two case studies later on from Andy and Mike talking about live instances in their own businesses. So, quick introduction about Menzies. That's the quick commercial bit. Um, we're a top 20 award-winning practice, seven offices across the UK. Our main focus is on strategic consultancy, talent management, and use of innovation and technology in business. Hence, we all love AI across eight core sectors. We're part of an international network as well. So, why the fuss about artificial intelligence and machine learning? Well, it's underpinned by the government's industrial strategy. It's supported by the government as one of the big challenges for the future, worth potentially billions to companies applying it successfully. And it's a key phrase from Boris Johnson these days to develop our, our thinking and technology platforms. If you think about the American Stock Exchange rising over the last few weeks despite COVID, the top performers have all been Amazon, Google, Facebook, uh, and the like. And a real live example, uh, three days ago, NVIDIA bought ARM in Cambridge for $40 billion. Uh, the only real reason for buying ARM was its AI capability. If you're using a smartphone or any smart app, most of the AI is actually done by ARM. Uh, and when NVIDIA bought it, they said, what we're buying is the future. So three main types of uh, artificial intelligence. Narrow artificial intelligence, which is where we are now. It handles one task. So if you think of Alexa, Google Assistant, Siri, for instance, you ask it a question, it searches for it and it comes up with an answer and it might tell you the weather or whatever you're doing. So that's where we are now in terms of the general marketplace. We're getting closer to general. That's more sophisticated, it handles more than one task at any one point in time, it solves problems, makes judgments, it plans and learns. So even if you think of your Alexa, you ask it a question and it says, I don't know the answer to that. You ask the question three times and then it comes back with an answer. It's searching all the time to develop ideas. The goal is the um, super artificial intelligence and who knows if that's even achievable. If you're an Arnold Schwarzenegger fan and watched uh, Terminator, Skynet, the computer on that, was the ultimate example of artificial intelligence taking over and running everything. We're not there. We're a long way from it. We may never get there. Advantages of artificial intelligence. There's a low error rate if coded properly. Precision, accuracy and speed are all much more prevalent. It adapts through progressive learning. Ask them a question, it develops. And it can work in hostile environments and it's non-stop. So you can increase productivity. One of the big problems in the UK, and you hear the buzzword on the news all the time, is the lack of productivity. Artificial intelligence can help you with that. It doesn't sleep, it doesn't get tired, it doesn't need a tea break, it carries on going, doing its task time after time after time and those repetitive boring tasks it gobbles up so there are some disadvantages as well uh, there's a cost to create data analysts and coders are not cheap people so if you're writing stuff or having it written for you there is a cost to it there's no original creativity yet it's not a free thinking original thought process so there has to be input it can reduce employment that's certainly a disadvantage because if you're going to do an automation task, that may get rid of a number of people off the shop floor. And it's got AI bias. So if you've got a coder and you're writing a particular program, let's say you've got four white middle-aged men all writing a code about a particular problem, you might find up 
I find out there might be bias in the coding that they've got. So you have to be aware of when you're writing it, whether there can be bias. And of course, one of the advantages is if everything is linked to artificial intelligence and machine learning, it might accelerate hacking and cyber terrorism. And Mike uh, from Cybrid will probably touch on that later on. So everyone says AI is coming for our jobs, but we're good at surviving. When we were hunter gatherers, the advent of farming and agriculture was supposed to end us all, but we have adapted and we've been adapting ever since. Certainly many traditional jobs will go, but access to training could create opportunities and solve other problems. So let's have a look at a few sectors and see what's happening. Transport and logistics. I've written a few points down there for you to see. So if you think of all of these things in the transport sector, they're all using artificial intelligence and machine learning, telematics, schedule optimization, fuel efficiency, dynamic fare pricing, service reliability, safety and improving customer experience, ultimately driverless cars. So that's just one sector and a few examples. Retail and wholesale. So reinvigorating the customer experience, next generation of engagement channels, think IBM instant checkout, Amazon, McDonald's. Every time you log on Amazon, it will then come back and say, were you thinking, were you looking at a hedge trimmer? I've now got 246 you can look at. You go into McDonald's, you're using a touch, touch screen. You're not talking to a, a, a customer assistant. You're ordering all your food through a, through a touch screen. FinTech, in many ways, the perfect match. Think of the range of information now on smartphones, on spending patterns, savings, needs analysis with challenger banks and the main clearers, all offering innovation and data. You can now get up on your phone what you've spent on any particular topic or subject, you know, what you spent on hairdressing, food and everything else. FinTech love artificial intelligence and gobble it up. Healthcare. Just think of the eight areas I've listed there. Keeping well, early detection, diagnosis, decision making, treatment, end of life care, research, training and so on. All of that will use artificial intelligence. Since COVID, everyone wants digital self-diagnosis. I've seen 15 companies in the last two weeks that are bringing to market products on uh, digital diagnosis, on pre-diabetes, cardiovascular, neurological, cancer, all linking biometric data to smartphones so that you can do your own self-diagnosis. Manufacturing. Again, manufacturing, you think of the automation on um, production lines, but look at some of the other areas, visual inspection, predictive maintenance, assembly, supply chain communication, cutting waste, post-production support, face recognition and surveillance, which obviously Mike will be speaking about later on from Cybrid. Manufacturing is a great adopter of artificial intelligence. Hospitality and leisure sector. The robotic concierge has arrived. Booking platforms, data analysis, immersive technology, gaming and augmented reality. All of that is using artificial intelligence, machine learning, data analytics. Think Netflix, recommending content based on tastes. If you've signed up to Netflix, you know that you get an email every day or a text saying, have you thought about, what about watching this? We think you'd like this. That's all using artificial intelligence. Property and construction. 7% of the world's labour is employed in construction. Smart construction, better design, risk mitigation, health and safety, productivity, all areas using artificial intelligence. Will we have robots building houses? Watch this space. So here's a takeaway moment. So now you want to take advantage of these rapid technological advances yourself. How do you go about doing it? Well, we'll have some live examples from Andy and Mike later on, but just think about your own business. Assess every aspect, irrespective of what sector you're in. Pick a worthy problem, focus on the human experience and evolve everyone's role to improve and if you just think about that for a period of time on any particular task in any particular part of your business you can probably then start thinking how do i make it better smarter smoother more immersive more interactive 
and then you've got an AI project. But the other takeaway moment, never fly solo. Speak to people who know about a problem. Scope the project properly. Review the project regularly. Focus on goals and what you want to retreat, achieve. Remember when, how much, how's it going? And again, I think Andy and Mike will touch on this later on. But it's very important to use people experienced rather than just trying to do it yourself. You can meet somebody and give them a very quick brief. They go away and write a piece of software, bring it back, and then you trial it and it does nothing that you wanted it to do because you haven't spent enough time thinking about the process and what you want to achieve. So you've got to speak to people because they'll have been through common problems and themes about how you go about doing it. I'm going to hand over to Rob now because he's going to talk about the tax breaks because invariably if you're writing code and doing things in this area there will be some tax breaks. Thanks Adrian. Um, so the, the tax breaks I'm going to talk about generally relate to um, technology businesses and businesses that are developing technology. So they specifically fit into the AI area, um, but these are wider tax reliefs. So the first two that we're, or the two that we're going to cover are the patent box regime and research and development tax relief. So the patent box regime is basically a tax relief that businesses get from exploitation of, of a patent. So it enables companies to get a lower rate of corporation tax from the profits that they generate using the patent. The headline rate of tax applied to these profits is 10% compared to the current 19%. So it's quite a good saving there. Um, so it can be claimed on income from the company's own patents that it owns in its own name or where the company is using patents and has exclusive license over a, a full geographic area. So for example, if you have exclusive license to distribute um, a product in the UK where there is a patent attached to it, you could get some patent box relief there and gain a tax advantage. Um, the patents that are covered are those granted by the UK IPO, the European Patent Office and a range of other European economic area countries. So how this it changes following Brexit, um, we're unsure at the moment. Um, you would think that that may be restricted slightly so that it might just be UK um, or some, uh, some other European countries as well. Um, but at this point in time, it covers all of those. So the way that patent box is calculated is, is reasonably complex. So there's, there's quite a big calculation that goes through, but what happens is you take the profits that are generated from that um, use of the, the patent, you then add back some elements called routine returns, and that's profits that you would ordinarily generate without using that unique IP. So that's um, sort of brand awareness and elements like that. So it's a difficult, difficult one to judge, but there is a, an add back for that. Um, and then also, profits from brands and marketing assets. So that's it's, it's similar, but not quite the same thing. There is one further bit to add to this, and that's something called a ne nexus fraction. So there's also an add back uh, or an adjustment made in respect of the amount of R&D that you actually undertake in generating that asset. So if your business doesn't generate the R&D itself in its own right to, to create the IP asset, then the claim that you can get is heavily reduced. If you undertake all of the research and development to create that asset, then the claim you can get is, is much larger. So moving on to research and development, um, this is essentially a tax relief that businesses can get from undertaking R&D activities. And what covers into that is, is if, you're, um, if there's an advancement in technolo <coughs> excuse me, technology or scientific advancement. So that could be extending the overall knowledge in an area, could be creating a new process, a device, uh, or increasing the overall knowledge in, in that sort of specific area that you're working on. It doesn't necessarily need to be brand new technology. It could be that you're improving the process that already exists. So if you're a manufacturing business and you're trying to improve the way that you process um, the items that you manufacture and you're doing it in a faster way, you can make those items cheaper, you make those items more durable in the process, then you can make an R&D claim on the, the changes that you're making and the research that you're undertaking in that area. The key bit that underpins all of this is that uh, is the final point on this slide is that it shouldn't be readily deducible by a competent professional. 
So if anyone in your area could go and do this, there's probably not an R&D claim there, but if you need specific knowledge or you need a combination of experts to get that a result, then there's a good chance you've got R&D to claim. So how it works, it's essentially a super deduction. So it doesn't go through your accounts as such, uh, it is purely done in the tax return itself. So it reduces your corporation tax charge or increases your loss if you're a loss making company. And if you are a loss making company, you can actually sell those back to the revenue uh, to get an R&D tax credit. And particularly when you're investing a lot in new technology, that cash flow can be really important. So just as a real brief example, this is a reasonably small business. They've got a turnover of 600,000. So we've got two columns here, sorry. We've got first column is a business that doesn't make an R&D claim. And the second column is a business that does make an R&D claim. So they've got 600,000 pound turnover. They've got R&D qualifying expenditure of 200,000 and non R&D qualifying expenditure of 100,000. So their accounting profit before anything else is 300,000. And with any other adjustments from a tax point of view without R&D, that would give you taxable profit of 300,000 and tax at 19% would be 57,000. With the second column, we get an additional enhancement because of the R&D. So you get 130% of whatever you've spent on qualifying research and development as an additional deduction in your tax return. So that means your profit of 300,000 is reduced by a further 260,000, giving you a tax profit of just 40,000 and a tax bill of 7,600. So you can see the tax saving between the two scenarios there just by making a claim is 49,400, which is a massive difference. If we've got a loss making company, this one's a bit smaller in turnover because they're, they're developing new technology. So they've got a turnover of 200,000, R&D claim expenses of 200,000 and non-R&D expenses of 100,000. So their accounting loss is 100,000 pounds for the year. Now the first business, they pretty much call it quits there. They've got no um, enhancement on there. They've got a taxable loss of 100,000 that they can carry forward to future years. The second business that's making an R&D claim, they still get that 260,000 pound additional deduction, making their taxable loss 360,000 pound. They can submit all of that back to HMRC for a 14 and percent tax credit, giving them a 52 and pound cash inflow. Now, again, that, that is a massive benefit if you're developing new technology. So what costs can qualify? Employee costs, and we see this as being the biggest cost for most businesses, for a lot of businesses. So in employee costs, you can take their salary or their wages, the employer's national insurance and the pension contributions that are attributed to that. You can also claim subcontractor costs. So if you have to get an external consultant or expert to help you with your project, you can claim a portion of their costs. If you have to buy bespoke software, and that could be a CAD license, you can make a claim on that as well. And that can be proportional. So if you only use it for 50% R&D, you can claim 50% of the cost. Materials consumed in the process. So if you're making prototypes that don't get sold, you can use uh, the cost of those materials as well. And also, so topical at the moment, clinical trial volunteers. So if you're paying someone to be part of a, a trial, you can claim the cost back on that and get the additional deduction from there, from that expenditure. Timing of the claim, it, it goes in as part of your normal corporation tax claim. So that means you've got 24 months after the period end to be able to make a claim. So that means if you've got a December uh, 19 year end at the moment, you can make a claim for that December 19, but you're still in time to make a claim on the December 18, year end, so long as you do that before the coming December. So what that gives, if you've never done a claim before, is you've actually got a two year window. And if you think of how that looks, if you're making a claim on December 2018, that means you're actually going back to costs from the start of 2018. So that could be January 2018. So that's the tax breaks on it. Um, just in conclusion on what Adrian and I have said. So th there's some advantages here. AI may eliminate some jobs is the, is the view, but actually it will create new ones. We're all able to evolve and develop, and from those elements, AI can only add benefit to our businesses. So I'm now gonna hand over to Dorothy, who's gonna speak um, about the legal impacts of AI. So Dorothy is a partner of More Barlow and specializes in advising businesses on their um, technology developments from a legal perspective. So I shall pass over to Dorothy now. Thank you, Rob.
So I'm now going to start screen sharing and um, I'll share my presentation slides. So good morning. Good morning, everyone. My name's Dorothy Agnew. I'm a partner in the commercial technology team at Morbalo. And for the next 15 minutes, I'm going to talk about some of the legal issues associated with AI and machine learning. This is what I mean by artificial intelligence and machine learning. These technologies are challenging because they enable machines to learn and take and implement decisions without human intervention. Businesses that are using or developing AI solutions need to understand their limitations and the extent that they will be liable for its performance. In legal terms, AI is property. The AI technology or the platform itself doesn't possess separate legal personality, which means that, that you or me as the business um, or the, the trader that's operating the AI will be responsible for its performance. I want to talk first about some of the framework of laws that apply when you're developing an AI tool. Any organization that uses an AI tool and personal data must make sure that their processing of the personal data complies with the Data Protection Act 2018, that's a UK legislation, which incorporates the General Data Protection Regulation in its entirety. What this means in a, a very quick summary is you have to process data fairly and lawfully and in a transparent manner regarding the rights of the data subjects. It means you've got to have a lawful basis for processing and meet certain security requirements. Failure, could, failure to comply could render your business liable to fines of up to 4% of annual worldwide turnover or 20 million euros. Confidentiality is also going to be really important to your technology because keeping your algorithm um, or the know-how within your technology secret may be central to preserving the value in your AI system. And this relies on the law of confidentiality. So when you're engaging third-party developers or sharing um, some of your technology with your suppliers or customers, make sure that you have strong confidentiality agreements with them. Thirdly, intellectual property law is relevant. Copyright will arise automatically in software that you write for your system. If you've come up with a name or a logo that you're using to promote and sell your AI or your AI enabled service, this may be protected by trademark registration. Then there will be databases that form part of your system and data sets that you use to train the AI may be protected as a copyright work or may qualify for protection as a database then your AI system may generate new copyright works. These could be designs or documents and AI systems may themselves result in new inventions which could be capable of patent protection. I want to move on to talk about some of the framework of laws that apply to the output of an AI system. On this screen I've listed some of those laws and these laws will impact to a greater or lesser extent on your AI system depending on the type of AI and the sector in which it's used. For example, negligence. A business that uses an AI system to provide information and advice to its customers could be liable to those customers for loss or damage that they suffer if the system gives misleading or inaccurate advice. Competition law may also be relevant when you're using an AI technology to promote sales of the goods and any arrangements which um, in lessen competition may be unlawful. And then discrimination on the grounds of a protected characteristic such as race or disability could be unlawful. To illustrate this, I'd like to take you through two case studies. The first one concerns two competitors, TROD and GBI. They sold wall art and they colluded to fix poster prices on Amazon Marketplace using an automated pricing algorithm. What this algorithm did is it monitored and adjusted the party's prices to make sure neither was undercutting the other. The CMA 
fined the parties 160,000 for carrying out an unlawful cartel. Now this wasn't artificial intelligence, but it raises the question, could your AI collude with your competitor's AI to maximize profits? The second case study concerns Amazon. In 2014, Amazon's Edinburgh office created an AI which would automatically sort through CVs and pick out the most promising candidates. It's a useful time-saving tool. What could possibly go wrong? Well, unfortunately, according to members of the team who spoke to Reuters, it quickly taught itself to prefer male candidates over female ones, and it penalised CVs that included the words women's, like women's chess club or women's college. Well, the problem stemmed from the fact the system was trained on data that had been submitted by people over 10 years and most of that data came from men. Ultimately, the recruitment tool was scrapped. The case study highlights, these case studies highlight two problems. Inherent biases in the data sets that are used to teach your AI may cause biases and discrimination in results. The second problem is that if you give your AI a goal of maximizing prices or generating new customers or hiring candidates, it may decide that in order to achieve that goal, it needs to engage in a certain behavior, and that behavior could be unlawful. This slide lists some of the, um, the bodies and the guidelines that are being set up in Europe and the UK. The trends that we're seeing from, although there are no, no laws as yet being introduced in the, in the UK specifically for AI, the trends we're seeing is a need to build safe and trustworthy AI and a desire for transparency. By that we mean explainability, being able to explain how your AI technology does what it does and accountability for the performance of the AI. It's not enough just to know the risks. You're developing your AI tool, how can you address these risks? Well, when developing AI tools, design them so they conform to current laws, which apply in the sector in which your tool is going to be used and make sure they can be updated to conform to new laws. Building functionality, which makes sure that the AI communicates new methods and new functionality before they're put into use so that you can check for legal compliance. Where personal data is being used, if the process is, processing is considered to be high risk or uses new technology, which is very likely with an AI tool, the GDPR requires a data protection impact assessment to be carried out to show that you've identified and assessed what those risks are and how you're going to address them. When designing machine learning system, map out all the ways that personal data might be used and use privacy preserving techniques at the design phase, for example, by adding noise to the data or anonymizing the data. And then under Article 22 of the GDPR, an individual has the right not to be subject to solely automated decision-making, which has legal or similarly significant effects. This is relevant if your AI or machine learning tool makes decisions about individuals. For example, it could be a decision about whether or not to grant them a loan or what sort of loan to offer them. It could be a decision about an exam result or a decision about their health. Next, on system procurement. So the board has decided to buy in this AI tool and you've been tasked with the procurement project. Here's how you address the legal risks. When you're acquiring an AI technology, whether as a license or a service um, or an acquisition, make sure you have a robust contract in place. Conduct due diligence on the system itself and the underlying data that's used to teach the system. Find out whether its learning has been supervised or unsupervised. Carefully review the specification of the AI system, understand its limitations and what controls are in place in the system to make sure there's continued compliance with relevant laws. Work with the AI provider to come up with a series of tests 
that tests the performance of the AI solution, including for bias and discrimination. Put in place ongoing tests to make sure that the system still works within the agreed parameters. Understand what intellectual property rights there is in the training data and the process data and the output. As I mentioned earlier, there will be intellectual property rights in these aspects of the, of the AI or machine learning technology and carefully document the ownership. The output of the technology or the way it works may give you as a user a competitive advantage that you don't want to be shared with the developers, other customers. The system provider must also have insurance to protect your business from some of the legal risks associated with it. The provider should accept responsibility for the performance of the systems, but it's likely that some limits or exclusions on liability will need to be negotiated. Consider obtaining ongoing support and maintenance for the AI and manage the performance and output of the tool used to provide advice or interacting with customers in the same way as you would a new member of staff. Proper oversight is really important. If you discover that your AI system is operating unlawfully or causing harm, make sure that you can take it offline quickly to prevent any further damage. And then finally, exit and handover. These things are maybe more complex with AI systems, so agree arrangements for handing the system back to you or to your new provider. It, with, with a license or service arrangement, it's unlikely that you'll be able to continue using the system itself, but um, you may want to receive the data in a usable format. So if I had a crystal ball, I would like to share these legal predictions for AI. Europe sees itself set in the global standard for human-centric AI. We can expect more laws around privacy and AI to come out of Europe, and the UK may well follow suit. Reputation and brand are going to be really important to build trust in AI, and we, we may see the rise in trusted um, intelligence, in, in intelligent brands. We may also see a rise or um, a set of standardised tests to assess the ethics of an AI solution and the need for transparency and explainability could conflict with the desire by businesses who want to preserve the value in the algorithm by keeping it confidential. If there's three things I'd like you to take away from this talk it's the following. Build in checks and controls, make sure that the AI solution doesn't learn to perform unlawfully. The legal issues around development and use of AI, they're board level issues, so don't just leave them to your provider or your, techno or your IT team. And then finally, the contract is king. Make sure you address things like ownership um, of intellectual property rights, support, handover and termination and allocation of risk in the contract. Thank you for listening. I'd now like to hand over to Andy Dolan of Tonic Analytics, who's going to talk about AI in the Galileo program and large scale analytic solutions. Thank you, Dorothy. Okay, I, um, I'm just going to work out how I, I think I stopped sharing. And I need some, I think I need some help in um, handing hosting over. So, so, ah. so f find me in the participant list. Yes, I see. Um, uh, you're you're yeah. in there twice. Um, yeah. Should it be your video? Go for the, the one without video. The one without video. Yep. Yeah, I've perfect. made you the host. I'm changing the host to you. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. Okay. There we go. Okay, good morning everyone. Thank you for that and thank you Dorothy in particular because there's a lot of relevance as we uh, get towards the back end of the few slides I've got here um, in, in what you've just said, um, in particular um, decision making around the individual using AI. Um, so I, I'm hoping to run you, th run you through a few examples of the way we use um, this kind of technology uh, within our business to solve really some quite big problems that are out there. Um, so as a company, just trying to make the actual slides move forward as a company um 
we, 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 we focus our, um, um, our business around helping large organizations to um, accelerate their, um, their needs around digital transformation and the kind of digital services that we provide. Um, we, we specialize in connecting data from a broad range of, um, of sources, such as physical assets, um, infrastructure, um, people themselves, um, processes, um, events that, uh, that, that, that may happen and also the wider environment. So, for example, weather conditions. Um, we, and we tend to join all that up into, into one model, as you'll see as we go through this. Um, our, our big focus is around advanced um, predictive analytics um, to uh, enable people to take action before um, uh, unwanted uh, uh, events and outcomes occur. Um, we're very focused on uh, working with our clients to understand the problem first and then quickly pilot solutions with them before they're moving to longer term uh, services. Um, we um, are an employee owned trust. In fact, we became so in January this year. And that's something we're very proud of. Um, and our background actually is in aerospace. Um, and, but as a business, um, we're very focused on how do we take our technology and learnings from aerospace uh, and apply them to um, other uh, markets. A little bit more about us just before we go into this. So we were very proud this year to um, uh, have gained the Queen's Award for Enterprise for our work in international trade. Um, and as you can see, we um, awarded science and technology category for South Coast. Uh, we're located on Southampton Science Park. Um, and as you can see, we've got a range of, um, uh, of the kind of standard type of accreditations you'd expect from a business um, of our nature, uh, including being members of um, Tech UK. Um, I'm just going to run through a video which hopefully will come out for you guys. Um, whether we get sound or not, I don't know, but there's, it's subtitled anyway. And it's just a couple of minutes long. It just gives you an insight into something called a digital twin, which is the key foundation block for our uh, uh, analytics and AI technologies to run on. Okay, so what I learned there is you get the video, but not the sound by default. Fortunately, we had subtitles on, so hopefully you, you guys got the message there. Um, but the Digital Twin, in summary, is where we take data from a broad range of sources, as I mentioned earlier, and we build one integrated model um, of that data to represent what's going on in the real world. And that's what we then apply uh, AI uh, technologies and other similar technologies to. Okay, so we, we tend to think of it as building the, uh, the unique DNA for what's happening within a particular ecosystem. Uh, just a few examples of that very quickly, because I want to get to one at the back end here. So one is um, we, we, we provide predictive analytic solutions for a, a range of airlines, uh, bringing together data from, as you can see, several sources, um, including the aircraft themselves, but also from the, uh, the maintenance repair organization, the operations and the schedule uh, data, uh, weather data, uh, location data, and even back into the supply chain with the uh, repair shop. Bring all that data together into digital twin, and that's where we apply um, uh, our predictive analytics uh, and learning 
um, and, and then we are able to provide notifications out to the airlines of potential issues with the aircraft that could have a significant impact on their operation. Okay. That's one, we've got a similar one here for uh, uh, helicopters, um, and we've got a couple of systems that are working here uh, with, some, with some major uh, operators and manufacturers. Um, again, uh, data coming from multiple sources being blended together. We provide predictive analytics on top of that. Uh, and for the helicopter um, 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 market, it's really focused on uh, enhancing the safety of those uh, aircraft themselves, uh, but also um, reducing uh, the cost of, uh, of operations and ownership. Um, oil and gas, another one. So as you can see, these are all fairly major industries and applications. Oil and gas, um, very similar approach, being taken together from a wide range of, uh, of sources. Uh, building that model of what's going on here, be particularly focused on subsea um, because subsea is very difficult to maintain, very expensive if you have to send um, 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 either people or equipment down there to fix things. Um, so they're very focused on how they protect production, um, reduce those costs, and also, of course, there's the risk of pollution as well. Um, so again, predict analytics alerts, which are looking for um, early signs of issues uh, before it has an operational uh, impact for them. Um, and the last one in terms of the quick uh, overview is um, working in the uh, logistics and supply chain area with trucks. Uh, so here we're making pr principally use of telematics data from the trucks and, th and that data gives us insight into the condition of the vehicle and the systems on the vehicle, uh, the driving style um, of, that, of the driver in that vehicle uh, and also obviously the location of that truck as well. And we blend that together um, with data from uh, their, yes, again, their maintenance system, but also we're interested in data about the load and the delivery schedule. So that ultimately, that's what the truck is doing and logistics is doing, is, is moving um, you know, um, goods from uh, A to B, um, and they're required very often on a kind of just-in-time basis. Um, so that's our real focus is how do we get those goods from A to B on time uh, without any hiccups in the logistics chain. Um, and we also look at weather and we look at term, uh, route plan uh, as well for that. Um, so we bring all that together, um, and, and as you can see in terms of value there, very focused on on-time delivery, ensuring that their customers have a good experience. Uh, and then of course for the logistics operator, we're keeping uh, their customer operations down. Uh, and through making use of driving style, we can also advance safety. Um, but the one I really wanted to quickly run through today was um, Galileo. So this is a program that we have been running now for uh, uh, about three years actually, joint with Highways High Inland and uh, the National Police Chiefs Council. Um, a whole range of uh, organizations involved in this and we're leading this program. Um, the objective here um, is uh, to achieve safer, more secure and more efficient road network for the UK with the focus today on the strategic road network which is um, motorways uh, and the major A uh, trunk roads in, in the country. Uh, the background to the program um, is set against um, some, uh, some, some fairly big uh, issues that the road network is experiencing uh, and that we'll all I think be largely familiar with um, in terms of the, the, the increasing volume of traffic admittedly COVID has had, uh, had some effect on that uh, in, a, in a positive sense um, but maybe not for the UK economy overall. Um, uh, congestion of course also has been reduced recently but uh, you know if you've been out and about on the roads in rush hour you'll still see that you still get uh, in, in traffic. Here we're particularly interested in congestion associated to incidents, so collisions uh, or fuel spills etc that happen on the road network uh, that do cause about a quarter of all congestion. Uh, safety, um, there are um, despite everybody's great efforts uh, across a range of organisations uh, there are still five people who die on the road every day in the UK and for the programme that's too many so we're working to tackle that. Um, you can see some figures around economic cost there um, in terms of the overall uh, cost of incidents to the UK economy as an estimate. Uh, there are costs for fatalities, each fatality sadly, um, I, I would argue that it's more about the uh, impact uh, on, on that individual uh, and their family and friends but um, there, is a, there is a figure put on that in terms of pants. Um, we, we've seen a overall decline in resources in terms of policing dedicated to the roads. Um, there, there is increasing um, relatively low level crime uh, happening associated to the roads. As you can see, an estimated uh, over 1 million uninsured drivers on the road, uh, even today. And of course, there's an increasing focus on the climate and how do we reduce um, um, emissions, which hopefully will naturally come through the use of uh, technologies like EVs, 
Um, but that, that, that's obviously still some way off. So how can we reduce that? So that's the background to the, uh, to the program. Um, I mentioned safe, secure, efficient road network. Um, so uh, we've really brought that down to how, how do we help to reduce the killed and seriously injured uh, on the road? How do we reduce that? How do we deny criminals the use of the road? Whether that's a criminal who, uh, frankly, um, it's a very broad definition, whether you haven't renewed your MOT, uh, you haven't paid your car tax or insured your vehicle, all the way up to, um, for example, more serious and organised crime, such as uh, county lines, for example. Um, and then on the right hand side, then we've got how do we reduce incident based uh, congestion? So that, that's our focus. Uh, what we need to do for that is make use of data because that's what we are as a business. Um, so again, a very similar model. Um, and this is where we've lifted that um, proven aerospace approach here uh, and applying it to the road. Um, so now we're bringing data from the road network and the instrumentation that exists out on that road network. Um, and that provides a lot of information about the speed of vehicles, the flow of traffic, uh, the volume of traffic. Um, we, we have uh, data from uh, about individual vehicles. In this program, we're not using data from vehicles. So we're not using telematics, but we've got information about the vehicles. For example, the type of thing that DPLA holds. Uh, we've got behavioral data. So that's associated to both keepers and owners of vehicles. Um, we have data related to incidents that happen on the road network. And of course, data about the um, what's going on in the wider env environment, be that weather or, uh, or or air quality, for example. So bringing all that data together, our focus here, uh, as you can recall, is around safety, uh, crime, and disruption. Um, and what I wanted to do is give you a bit more insight into the kind of information now that we're bringing together, and to give you some sense of scale, um, we're looking at a few years worth of data here. Um, there are um, as you can see, we've broken it down into, into the categories of vehicle, people, environment and road network again. Um, to give you some sense of scale, um, we have data for a total of 59 million vehicles um, that we're working with. Um, and in terms of incidents that happen on the road network, um, there are officially recorded and that we have data for about 1 million per year. Okay, to so give you some sense of the scale of what we're working for with here. And in terms of the um, information we get from the road network, so there are a wide range of uh, sensors that are either uh, embedded under the road surface or radars by the side of the road um, and they produce a huge amount of data um, across the network in terms of um, the movement of traffic um, and we also have things like um, uh, uh, ANPR uh, information um, and speed camera data etc so you can see there's a, there's a huge range of data uh, from people um, we um, are very interested in how um, people's behavior relates to this because in essence everything else there is an inanimate object uh, so in terms of people um, we're very interested in breaking that down to either uh, the roles and responsibilities of a keeper and their compliance so things like tax insurance mot um, and the condition of the vehicle uh, but also the driver so the driver is the one that is more likely to example to decide to speed um, or get involved in dangerous driving etc okay so it's a the breakdown there and you can see we have a wide range of records there and we're also at the moment also looking at not just criminal uh, related offences um, that we have within the information provided by the police but also civil offences such as um, uh, repetitive parking offences that get unpaid which are a good behaviour indicator of, uh, of a general um, lack of compliance um, out there um, so you can see lots of different information that we're bringing together um, what do we do with that data on this program is um, we, um, we have a delivery board, uh, as you can see, that's made up of uh, many uh, key organisations over on the left hand side there. Uh, and the delivery board sets the priorities for our work uh, and the programme. Um, we then go through a discovery phase with the data that we have available. Um, and then that then leads to us piloting initially solutions um, and then ultimately uh, taking those to a production level. Um, and we work to provide um, not just the intelligence, but to provide in a way um, that can foster collaborative action across all of the various organizations uh, that you can see on, on the left hand side there on the delivery board. Um, uh, to, to, uh, but a big, uh, very strong focus on ensuring that what the program does is deliver public outcomes. Now, what I wanted to just touch on was some of the um, um, uh, projects that we're working on and have been working on. So, one of them is um, around um compliance crime and safety and there what we're doing is we're looking at the links between uh compliance on the road network 
um, um, together with uh, related crime events that happen on the road network and safety um, um, uh, issues out of the road network. So vehicles involved in collisions, for example, uh, would come into that category. So what we're, we're looking at a very broad set of data there to try and understand what those links are. In terms of um, other criminality, we are looking at what the relationship is between um, uh, crime that happens related to the road and wider criminality that happens in society um, to understand the links there. So county lines, for example, would be a good, uh, a good example of that. Um, and then in terms of speed, um, we have a specific pilot related to speed on the road network. Um, and in fact, we were asked during lockdown to um, provide some predictive uh, um, analytics, which were actually providing um, um, predicted hotspot locations on the strategic road network um, that the uh, police were able to um, target. Um, and because there was a sudden increase in, in high speed vehicle use um, during that period when the roads were much quieter. Um, but we're also looking at the links between speed and other road related behaviours that are out there. Um, network disruption is an interesting one. So that's really quite different. So here uh, we're making use of a, a number of the data sets that we have within the digital twin uh, to um, attempt to improve the cost modelling for individual major incidents that happen on the strategic road network and the purpose of that is to underpin, underpin uh, future business cases for where is investment best put in order to reduce uh, the effect of that disruption on the UK economy due to incidents uh, and the last one um, is around uh, really kind of brings it all together actually which is um, around tasking coordination for uh, police and other key organizations um, driven by uh, data-driven intelligence. Uh, that's around how do we provide a tool to help help them to um, provide um, prioritised uh, collaborative tasking to address uh, upcoming issues that uh, are seen within the data as we create new data insights. Okay, so that's just some examples of some of the activities. Uh, and the last slide I've got here around the activities that we get up to, uh, making use of AI in a quite broad sense, um, are uh, and this picks up I think very well on Dorothy's slide is um, in all of our previous programs we've been focused pr principally on data from machines uh, and assets um, and here we find ourselves very much dealing with uh, sensitive data personal data uh, and potentially making decisions uh, about individuals or supporting those decisions at the very least um, so that has taken us into uh, a whole new area uh, where we now need to consider uh, much more the lawfulness of what we're doing with the processing of the data, the security of that data and resulting intelligence, uh, the ethics around making use of the kind of technologies that we have to support those decisions. Uh, and then ultimately, how do we make these, uh, the, the, the solutions that we're building here, how do we make them consumable uh, by the various users? So some of the solutions uh, and approaches we've taken to that are um, this program, um, uh, applied and was accepted to join the Information Commissioner's Office uh, sandbox phase. Um, so there are currently 10 programs uh, within, the, uh, within the UK which are uh, working um, together with the Information Commissioner uh, to deliver outcomes that are for the public good uh, and make use of uh, uh, data-driven technology and AI technologies. So we're making use of that uh, uh, really at the edge of what's understood around current data protection law. Um, so we are really helping both the ICO to learn and ourselves to uh, remain within the law as we progress this. Uh, and we've done that through the signature of a formalized agreement with the ICO. So anybody who's working in these kind of areas with this kind of data, um, I would strongly recommend that that's an excellent place to, uh, to be able to, uh, to learn and make progress uh, with your program together with the ICO rather than just viewing them as a regulator. Uh, security, we're actually working with a local company at the moment. Um, who, um, uh, so we have a, um, a dedicated, um, secure um, um, cloud environment um, and that has uh, secure links into a number of the public sector networks that enable us to do the data sharing that's required. Um, ethics, which I broadly boiled down to, um, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Um, it's very important we do the right thing for the individual. Um, and, and there we're engaged with um, the Centre for Data uh, Ethics and Innovation, which is part of the um, Department of Digital Culture, Media and Sport. Uh, and we also have a dedicated focus on ethics um, through an activity called AlgoCare, um, which is a, um, a roads policing 
uh, or rather policing actually focused uh, um, data ethics uh, activity. Um, and then in terms of consumability, uh, we work hand in hand with all of the stakeholders here. And as we build um, and roll out the tools that we've been providing, um, we, we work hand in hand with them to make sure that the outputs that we provide are actionable. Um, and so that it's not just a case of providing in data driven intelligence, but that we can ultimately deliver on the public outcomes that we seek to achieve. So there you go, that's a quick insight into some of the things that we get up to uh, locally uh, to Southampton, uh, which I think have got quite a, quite a broad range um, of, um, um, of appeal. Okay, thank you. So I'm gonna now hopefully hand over to, that's a good question. Who am I handing over to? I think it's me. <clears throat> That is Mike, right? Yes. Okay, cool. More. Okay, coming your way. Okay, Mike, you should now have it. That's great. Thanks, Andy. Really appreciate that. Um, so, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Jenkins. I'm um, the Chief Commercial Officer for Cybrid Solutions, and we're an IT and technology company. Uh, based out of Havant um, in Hampshire. And I'm just going to share with you <clears throat> my screen uh, one second so that you can see my slides. There we go. So that, that should, um, you should have my uh, slides set now. Um, so we're a reasonably small uh, business, there's only 10 of us, so we're based out in Havant and um, we provide quite a, a wide range of different um, technology uh, services to our customers, um, and uh, oops, that's there we go, that's better. And um, you know, one of the uh, areas we're going to talk about two areas today actually of how we use AI um, in in the, the data sets uh, in the in the product sets for our customers. Um, uh, one's going to be around cybersecurity, and the other one's going to be around uh, the use of um, AI in video analytics. Um, and um, but what I also want to talk about first is, is uh, the importance of context. Um, we're offloading uh, decision making uh, to, to computers with AI. We're asking it to, um, to learn, to make decisions. And as with any decision in life, uh, the context is really important. If you, if you get the context right, you often can make the wrong decision. And um, we, you know, we've seen We've seen uh, examples that have been mentioned today about how uh, AI is being used in, in online retail and, and Amazon are probably one of the biggest users of um, AI, uh, predominantly because they have a huge AI platform of their own. Um, so we've all uh, found ourselves uh, on the Amazon website with uh, having bought things before and of course what it does is it makes lots of suggestions around what else it thinks you might want to buy and the AI that it has uh, there is looking at all sorts of information, including information about you, information about people like you, the things you've bought, the things people like you have bought, and it will start to make some interesting suggestions. Um, however, out of context, those suggestions can sometimes fall slightly wider of the mark. Um, and there's a great, uh, this tweet here from a couple of years ago from a, 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 a slightly bemused Amazon customer uh, somewhat highlights um, how you can how it can be more of a, a miss than a hit, and I'll read it for you. It says, um, "I bought a toilet seat because I needed one. Uh, necessity, not desire. I do not collect them. I'm not a toilet seat addict. And no matter how temptingly you email me, I'm not going to think I'll go on then. Just one more toilet seat. I'll treat myself. Um, because out of context, it's a ridiculous notion to think that someone's going to buy lots of toilet seats. And in another case, a customer complained that Amazon suggested a variety of cremation urns after he purchased one for his deceased wife, assuming the AI assumed that if he liked the first one, he'd, he'd buy us some more. <clears throat> so it's it's a light-hearted but simple example of how you know you you can get it wrong if you don't consider the context. And our first product here, um, which we're going to talk about, it, it really focuses on context um, and that product is basically a cyber security um, a solution uh, from a company called Darktrace and Darktrace is um, a, a very interesting um, uh, product because it's, it's, it's not been on the market very long but it's actually already very mature because an awful lot of development's gone into it and basically 
what Darktrace does is it uses unsupervised machine learning to uncover rare and previously unknown deviations or unseen deviations in your network behaviors. So we put Darktrace onto our clients' networks um, and our clients vary across all sorts of um, industries. So that's manufacturing, finance, legal, uh, travel, a little bit in healthcare and other bits in, uh, you know, other, other uh, industries and even retail. Um, and uh, what, what Darktrace does is um, it monitors what typical data usage and data movements look like on a client's network. Uh, and that way, anything that's unusual starts to stand out. And the system largely trains itself, um, which makes it kind of easy for us to install because we don't have to sit there and provide hundreds of hours of training data or configure whitelists or start telling it what normal looks like on, on a customer's network so that it can benchmark it. It does all that work all on its own uh, which means there's an initial period where we start to we, we start to just let it train we don't really let it do anything it just sits there for a few weeks um, if you wander into your server room any day and have a look at all the servers and flashing lights and switches and all those different things that are in there uh, and ask yourself well how do I know what's going on behind all those lights um, the, the answer is you probably don't uh, very few people do and at best, you could probably switch on some detailed logging, um, and but that's just going to generate tens of thousands of lines of logs. And, and well, how do you how do you really see a pattern in that? How do you how do you get anything useful out of that log? Um, and what Darktrace does is it kind of starts to visualise it, so you can see it uh, as uh, uh, as if it was a an actual thing in front of you. And this this uh, little clip here is showing how Darktrace is, is mapping out devices on a network. We've got some mobile devices, some PCs. And then their, their route through the firewalls out into external connections out in, uh, on the internet. Um, and it's a couple of those PCs, you'll notice the yellow, it's not happy with something. Um, it's seen some unusual behavior. And, and unusual behavior could be a virus in the system, it could be an external hack, it could be some internal data movement caused either accidentally or intentionally by a staff member. Um, it then visualizes that what it sees as a threat and it presents it either for investigation so that you can manually take action um, or it can automatically take action to prevent a hack um, or data theft as it's happening and lock down parts of the system. Um, you know, I've been involved with, with helping customers. They're normally not our customers. They normally become our customers because they've had an issue and they ring us up. And, um, you know, we had a phone call not that long ago from someone who was in the middle of a, a reasonably hefty uh, data hack and didn't know what to do. Uh, we didn't know their network because they weren't a client, but we ran in and, and the most we could do to start with because they didn't have anything like this was switch everything off, which is massively disruptive to, to, to a large business. What Darktrace can do is actually switch off just that data thread and actually just stop that, that, that event that's happening without killing everything. And then, and then you and, and give you a really detailed understanding of what happened. So it's a real time protection that you, you don't really get anywhere else. Um, all firms have got data and IP that's valuable to them and needs protecting, but without a system like this, which is AI powered, there's really no way of knowing for sure that your data is not being manipulated or copied or stolen or deleted until after it's happened. And that's, that's often too late. Uh, most cybersecurity uh, events uh, end up with some some form of trying to figure out what happened long after it happened, not whilst it's happening. Um, so any firm that handles valuable data, you know, accountancy practices, law firms, manufacturing healthcare, um, the ramifications of not being able to prevent a data breach as it happens, it can be serious. Um, and, uh, and, you know, has, we've seen it uh, bring firms to a closure. Um, without AI, none of this real time processing of what could be millions of transactions um, you, you couldn't do, you couldn't form those against complex uh, models without, without AI and you need that to evaluate what's normal uh, and what's a risk. Um, you know, if you look at what we did in, in the old days, we logged, we audited and you got stuff like this. Um, and then you, you put some rules in, uh, you put in a file, we hope you've done enough. Um, for a lot of companies that's still their security strategy. If a breach occurs, you hope your monitoring is going to pick it up and then you sit and try and pour over logs like this to figure out what happened long after the event. Um, and Darktrace enables companies to get a real time intervention on data instance as they're happening and, and then they act upon them before it's too late. Importantly, without needing to know what you're looking for, um, how, you know, how, do you, how do you prevent uh, a breach if you don't know what you're looking for? Uh, the threats change 
almost daily. And dark traces AI and machine learning it means you don't need to know what you're looking for because it's looking for the unusual. It's looking for standout events. It's looking for something that doesn't meet what happens normally on your network. And that's the, that's the real key is it's, it becomes a very tailored solution. This apologies, this slide moves way too fast. Um, but <laughs> this is some visualizations of the sort of way that dark trace takes what you saw before, which was streams of logs and turns them into a real time visualization of what's actually happening on your network, what's going between devices, what's going out to the internet. Um, it's a massively powerful tool. And at the bottom of some of those, you'll see these little uh, squares with orange to red. And it's basically highlighting events and saying, this is something I blocked, or this is something you might want to look at. Um, it's, uh, you know, and then we can remotely assist a customer with those events, um, or the dark trace appliance could, could do that for them or their internal teams could be trained to know how to manage an incident. Um, and uh, it's, it's interesting to note that you, a lot of times people invest in this technology because they've had a breach. Uh, they, have, they have a major incident, they lose you know, six figure sum, a uh, massive amount of downtime, and then go, okay, well perhaps we should buy some decent tools to stop it happening again, which is, it's a bit like locking your door after you've been burgled. Um, it, it's, it's better to do it first. Um, so a lot of, one of the biggest objections I tend to hear is, well, you know, why do we need this? Why is it, yeah, this isn't going to happen to me. As, as humans, we tend to think that disasters are things that happen to other people. Um, but data security uh, risks are only increasing and the complexity of those threats um, is only increasing. Um, and, and don't take my word for it, Forbes, um, uh, this, this um, piece of information is quite interesting because in the first six months of 2019, um, uh, they calculated that 4.1 billion records have been exposed um, uh, through reported data breaches in the first six months of 2019. Um, that's the ones that we know about. That's ones that, that got reported. There's, there's a lot of data breaches that don't go reported. There's a lot of data breaches that go undetected um, and companies don't even know they've lost the data. Um, and in 2019, cyber attacks were considered the top when in the top five risks for global security by the World Economic Forum. Interestingly, within that top five was a global pandemic. Um, so they were spot on the money with that one. Um, and uh, you know, people, a number of states and a number of um, individuals have taken advantage of the the global pandemic situation um, in an attempt to steal data. And we've seen state-sponsored attacks on our institutions trying to disrupt or intercept um, our vaccine research. Um, and it, it, you know, they were very complex uh, attacks that were, were, were put into place very rapidly by um, uh, individuals who, who wanted to disrupt what we were doing. Um, there's some other uh, large scale um, uh, data losses that occurred that have sort of stood out in the history of big data losses. Um, Equifax lost 145 million uh, accounts uh, in 2017 with some pretty uh, personal data in there. Um, that was in the States. And then Facebook lost half a billion records um, from an Amazon cloud server. Um, and First American lost um, 885 million records. And, and it's easy to look at those and think, well, I, I, we're not we're not this, that size of a, an organization, organization. We don't have 800 million records to lose. The point, the point here is that these, these guys haven't underinvested in technology. They haven't underinvested in security and they still got caught out. Um, it's also interesting to note that not one of them is a dark trace customer. Um, so <laughs> I'm not saying I can guarantee it wouldn't have happened, but um, again, we, even, even large organizations can get caught out um, none more so than at Yahoo, who um, had three billion accounts compromised uh, not that long ago. Nearly, nearly wiped them out uh, as a as a business, and they're one of the oldest um, internet companies there are. Um, but actually, a lot of threats come from inside your organisation, um, and the largest uh, example of that was an attack uh, or exfil of data that occurred over a thirty-year period at Boeing. Um, when two billion dollars uh, worth of aerospace documents uh, were being slowly leaked out of their network by an employee. And from our experience using products like Darktrace, 
I would say the vast majority of the threats and um, uh, points that we have to focus on within um, within our client base are, are internal issues. Um, not always malicious, but sometimes um, staff often leave to do the same job for one of your competitors, um, and they often know they're going to leave long before they tell you. Um, and it's very it's not very unusual, should we say, to find that um, they take something of value with them and they normally do that long in advance of handing their notice. Um, and um, 30 years worth of uh, information being leaked out of a network and no one spotted it. We'll grant them that in 1970s to 80s there probably wasn't the, the systems available to detect it at that time, but there certainly was, um, you know, in the latter part of that. Um, and we use AI in other parts of our security. Uh, this rather slowed down slide shows us how um, this is provided by Bitdefender, one of our um, threat protection systems we, we use. Um, there are global um, incidents being mapped here of, of hack attacks, viruses, malware across the globe. If I was to play this in real time, you wouldn't see it would move so fast it would be a blur. So we slow this down. These are tens of thousands of events happening literally every hour. Um, and what we see there is, is it, it only increases. We also use AI, obviously, in heuristic detection engines for antivirus, anti-ransomware, um, anti-spam, and all of those things. So um, I dare say businesses here that don't think they're using AV, uh, AI, sorry, um, they probably are, they just don't realize it to some degree through some third-party product. So security is a massively complex um, subject. I could go on all day and, and bore you all, but, um, that's just a taste of some of the things we can do with something like Darktrace, which is a massive step up in terms of proactive um, network security that really nothing else um, uh, comes close to. The next thing uh, really I was going to talk about was our uh, intelligent video surveillance uh, surveillance systems. We're, we're using AI in cameras now um, in, a, in a way that you know we weren't even just two or three years ago. Um, and we're doing AI within the camera itself rather than offloading it onto servers. Um, and that gives us a huge amount of um, options and, uh, and features that, that we really didn't used to have and means that we can do all of our an analysis in real time. So we can do things like um, detect abandoned luggage, um, analyze crowds, see how they move, are they safe? Uh, we can manage queues, we can find smoke, fire, fluid leaks, even gas leaks, all of this through optical um, camera analysis rather than having to have the banks of sensors or thermal monitoring. Um, we can tra uh, monitor traffic, um, both pedestrian and vehicles, and then we can tie all of these systems in to manage other systems like barriers, traffic signals, um, fire, fire systems, you know, pretty much anything you want. Uh, and we can perform behavioral, uh, behavioral analysis in public spaces to determine threat levels. So in, we can identify individuals who act suspiciously um, who loiter, um, and there's, there's some work we've done on, on um, public spaces um, to help make them safer, uh, and even to help redesign um, how public spaces are laid out using analytics to calculate how busy areas are, and how the space is used, and even the demographic of the people that use it at different times of the day. There's a really basic example here of um, using some AI in retail, and what we're doing here is we're just counting people up and down aisles, um, you know, who went through uh, which aisle in what direction. This is really, really basic, but, uh, but this is it's a very simple example. We can get more complex with this and actually uh, cover individual parts of the shelves uh, and then overlay that with point of sale data. So if you've got a product like you've got here on this end of aisle um, freezer that's not selling, well, is it not selling because people don't want it or is it not selling because they're not seeing it? Are they loitering in that area, looking at it, moving away and still not buying it? So you can start to bring the, 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 the point of sale data along with the uh, video analytics and, and try and determine, is it the product that's wrong? Is it the placement that's wrong? Is it the way we've, is the signage wrong? Um, or, or is it the layout of the store that's wrong? Um, and we're doing this on, on um, you know, the CCTV system essentially that's also being used for security. Um, so the days of having CCTV that just records things and then you hope one day you might play something back and find something interesting, you know, that's really should be long behind us. The cameras are such a powerful tool to do so much more with uh, and still we're finding uh, most industries are struggling to catch up with that notion. Um, there's another example here of um, traffic analysis. This is quite a basic one. 
Um, we're literally just uh, analyzing what the cars are. Are they cars, trucks, vans, motorcycles? And then there's a little number there next to each one, which is the, the confidence level, the AI, where it's reported about how, how certain it might be, how certain it is. And, you know, in most cases, it's, it's reasonably accurate, but we can overlay this with uh, other, other, other sensors, but also add more AI to determine a lot more than just what is it. We can count the cars, we can work out their speed, their size, um, how long they queue for, and, and obviously add that to time of day, weather, month, day of week, month, year, whatever we want start to build a pattern. Um, we could put a number plate recognition into this too, um, cross-reference that with DVLA records that would tell us which cars have got what engine type, size, numbers of seats, um, are they tax assured, MOT'd, um, and we can do all of that by just plonking a camera down. Um, uh, we don't have to put complicated sensors in place um, and it will record day and night with an infrared lens attached to this. Um, it sees just as well in the dark as it does in the daytime. Um, and again, the old fashioned way of doing that was to put people at the side of the road in high vis jackets with a clipboard to sit and try and figure out what the, you know, what, what the traffic stats were. And we can do this at intersections with multiple cameras and work out, well, who took which route through an intersection. Um, uh, and uh, I'll just rattle through a few different uh, videos here. This is a guy uh, in a hospital for one of our, this is a healthcare demo. The minute he moved, it detected he was a person. He's got a green box around him because everything's fine right now. Um, but what we discover is he has a little uh, headache and falls over. Um, he immediately, that box turned blue as he started to fall. So this is our anti-spill AI and that could alert a staff member. This one moves quite quick. This is um, detecting age, gender and the general mood of someone uh, walking out the store. The clip was a bit short, apologies for that. And this one is detecting the fact that someone's wandered off with a painting off the wall of the cafe. Um, and what you'll see is a little box is about to appear, doink, there we are, where the um, picture was. And that works even from slightly obtuse angles, it doesn't have to be square on. We've set the blue area sets our monitoring spot. It, it's, it's just an example of how we can use the cameras to detect objects um, disappearing. And this one's being used to count spaces in a car park and figure out if they're full up or not. Um, again, we could put uh, number plate recognition in that and use that to drive barriers, um, car park pay systems, or, or even determine whether or not that's a staff member and they should even be there or not. So there's so much you can do with video AI. I could be here all day. Um, this, this is a great example. We're only monitoring on the left lane here and that's worked out vehicle type, speed, size. Um, so that was a slightly more complex um, demonstration. Um, uh, and these would, you know, th this shows you now how we can measure it and, and a very topical one. Um, we're using a thermal layer to actually take a reading of an individual um, for thermal processing to make sure that they're under the limit to allow them access, which is obviously, you know, very relevant now in, in the days of COVID. So we can do thermal detection um, across huge groups of people as well and actually figure out, you know, in an airport, if you've got 150 people stood at a checking queue, you can actually scan them all in one fell swoop. Um, and there's facial recognition and other layers. So we've got, we've got quite a few apps, uh, AI apps that can be customized that you can drop straight onto a camera, um, onto one of our cameras. We predominantly use Mobotics, um, a fantastic German brand of cameras that um, are immensely powerful um, and very secure. And uh, as you can see there, the sky's the limit as to what they can do and then we can feed that data into kind of any system you want, whether that's a database for future analytics or actually real time driving other systems. So we've got a lot of manufacturing businesses that have cameras across their manufacturing estate and we're using them for safety. We can spot fire, smoke, um, and then actually shut a machine down if it starts to overheat or, or, or even alert an operator if a machine just physically comes to a stop. Um, and we tie them into door control systems and all sorts of things. So immensely powerful. Um, and there's a few different um, examples there of um, things we've done, you know, just, just re you know, in, the, in the last you know, couple of years. So um, the sky really is the limit with AI and it's, it's, uh, it's important that, you know, where AI can drive value to a business or product or enhance a client experience or improve profits, um, you know, it, it can also be used to, to protect uh, an investment you've already made. So every industry, every company uh, within it is unique. Um, you know, we've all got our challenges uh, and our goals and plans. 
Um, so there is no such thing as a one size fits all solution. And that's why AI is so useful because across all those industries, it's ability to learn and adapt and evolve and improve. Uh, means every AI installation ultimately ends up being yeah, uniquely adapted to its environment. And, and that means it can you know, perfectly focus on delivering the specific uh, benefits and protections that, um, that, that is, is needed to, um, to meet the latest threat or, or provide the most relevant uh, benefit. Um, so that's pretty much all my slides here um, today. Um, um, I'm going to uh, hand back to, who am I handing back to? I think it's Dorothy. Um, it's Rob. Hand back to Rob. Yes. He's going to do Q&A. <laughs> should have known that. Apology. <laughs> right. I will stop my screen share there, Rob, and I am going to hand back to you. So thank you, everybody. Thanks, Mike. So I'm going to uh, just unmute everyone, I think, just so that we can all take a a, um, a question if we need to. So for, for all those watching, um, if you have a question you'd like to raise for anyone, then please use the chat function on here to, to put that up to us. Um, if we can collect a couple in, then, then I'll just sort of read those out and hopefully get some answers from the guys that have presented. I think hopefully what you've seen there today, though, is there's been some real useful bits come from the guys in terms of some real life um, use cases and covering the legal elements and some, some of the tax and account, well, not accounting so much, but the tax impacts as well, using AI. So um, let's just open this chat function up and see if we've got any questions. <clears throat> I think just while we're waiting for those to come in, um, I, put, I have one, one sort of question to cover off, and this kind of goes out to everyone really, but um, with, with the camera collection data and, and systems collecting data, there's lots of privacy elements surrounding that. Obviously, there's a lot of personal information in there, and Andy covered off some of those bits, but in the world of GDPR and, and the ethical considerations and things, how do you know where to draw the line in terms of what you can do with the data that you've got? Um, uh, in short, it kind of varies. Uh, we, we try to look at every single uh, um, application uh, uniquely and try to understand uh, precisely how far do we need to go you know what, what's the what's the ultimate objective we, we did a piece of work in London doing um, measurements on public space and uh, it used an element of facial recognition um, ultimately we weren't really interested in who the people were but we needed the facial recognition element to identify them again within that space so um, what we did is is we didn't store their face uh, the, the, the image of their face was never actually recorded to anything um, and one of the, the excellent things about uh, doing the AI in the camera is you can do that image redaction in the camera sensor before it hits the, um, the media where it's recorded. So what you then have is um, their face never ever existed in any data storage ever. What we do is we, we, we convert the face to um, a, an algorithmic number essentially. And then if that face appears on the camera again, we'll always get the same number. So that enabled us to identify the movement of a person. Um, legally, it was a little bit complex and we engaged with the client's legal team and their counsel to, to understand from a GDPR perspective what, what was the primary um, uh, focus for, for the, the data processing, what was the primary purpose. Um, and um, you know, they, they, were, they were happy at that time in that instance that um, because it was a CCTV system that was already there and, and it was there for safety and security, that, that that primary purpose still stood. But it is complicated and, and we always aim to store as little data and process as little personal data as possible to achieve the end game. And then it comes down to going through the GDPR process of, of identifying those um, processing requirements and then working with the legal team to to button it up but um it does require a really focused ethical approach to to because you can get carried away with the tech otherwise um, and, and that's yeah. really important to avoid that one thing i would i would yes i think that's a really good point mike and one thing i'd add to that just on the on the subject of compliance with the gdpr this is where your data protection impact assessment is essential because it's a way of considering firstly are you even processing personal data mm. if you are then you analyze well what are the privacy risks associated with that processing um, are those risks high and what steps can we take to reduce those risks and protect the privacy of individuals 
I, I, I'd, I'd agree with that, Dor Dorothy. I mean, I think the DPIA mm -hmm. uh, document is absolutely uh, central to that. Um, and um, ultimately, the hard stop is both data protection law and, and human rights law. So you have to remain within that. Um, and as Mike says, I think it was mentioned in my page, you, you also have to think of the ethical aspects of this. Um, so I think what's key is understand what you're trying to achieve. Um, make sure you, you document that. And also you then use the minimum um, of personal data that you can to achieve that objective. Uh, that, that then allows you to focus right in on then addressing the, the lawful and legal aspects of using that data. So you can boil it right down to a kind of a pinpoint that you need to worry about. Thank you. Um, so I've got a couple of questions come in. <clears throat> One is, um, this is for Mike to start with. So with the dark trace solutions, is what sort of costs are involved uh, for a business for this sort of thing? Is it just for large enterprise or can SMEs make use of this? Type of thing? So it's not just for large enterprise and actually um, uh, what predominantly SMEs are one of their sort of mainstay customers. Um, but obviously uh, enterprises show a lot of interest in it, but um, uh, costs are it's always difficult because as with everything, it depends. There's, the, the size of the network has an impact. How, uh, what features you want enabled is, is a different feature sets that can be turned on and off. But what we, what we typically do is, is we, we sit down with the customer, we look at the network, we have a chat about what they're trying to get out of it. We do what we call a proof of value. Um, we introduce them to the device and we can even do um, uh, you know, free of charge trials if there's a genuine interest uh, and get a device on site and show you what it would have found and what it's finding. Um, it's normally in a passive state at that point, it's just telling you what it would have done rather than you normally from, from, from the first instance, just let it sit there and start turning things off on your network. So it, it's very passive in that state, but it, it shows you what it can do. Um, uh, uh, we, we wouldn't want anyone to, to start going down the road of buying something that's, you know, more than they need. But ultimately, SMEs tend to tend to be harder hit. Um, it's, it's the big companies, the enterprises that make the headlines, but it's the SMEs that take the brunt of cyber attacks, internal attacks, because they're often um, underprotected and, and, and don't have the tools in place to actually discover what's going on until afterwards. And I suspect this is probably hundreds and hundreds of cases of people who walked out of a business that they, you know, they, on their last day taking uh, IP and client data with them and their employer never ever knew about it and still, and never will. So, um, you know, some of the so SMEs will probably have one of the greatest um, benefits because they're, they're so far away from where they need to be often. Okay, brilliant. thank you. Um, <clears throat> there's a question come in um, for me about R&D tax relief. So, um, it says that I mentioned there's a condition about it can't be, uh, could be done by a competent professional, which might take them away from the claim. So it says, is this specifically defined as one person or can that be three people? So the point about um, can anyone else do it? So can a competent professional do it? Is basically if you're undertaking something that you think qualifies for R&D tax relief, is <clears throat> could somebody else that has reasonable knowledge in the industry go and do it? So if we sort of take that at a really basic level, if you've got an IT developer and they're, they're building a bit of software that is using standard industry modeling, um, they're not using any particular sort of additional software on top of uh, sort of an industry known, I don't know terminology for this, but in an industry basic bit of uh, kit, they use it. And you could just go down the road to another developer and they could do exactly the same thing, then they're probably not undertaking R&D. If, however, they're having to combine knowledge from various places, they're using unusual software and they're creating something that isn't readily available in the marketplace, then, then that is an R&D claim from a, from a tax perspective. So it's not so much about whether it's one person, two people or ten people. It's more about what is actually going on and could, could that easily be done in the industry and do other people readily have the know-how to do it? So I hope that answers that bit. Um, there's another question coming from Mike, uh, and this is about uh, so this is it's about facial recognition, and I think you've sort of touched on this, but it just says how would you go about storing personal data on people from facial recognition? Uh, again, I guess it depends on what you're using it for. So you know, we've used facial recognition for things like access control systems. Uh, in that case, um, typically they're a staff member or, or someone who who is aware that you're doing it and you're storing. 
uh, it, it, you actually don't store an image of their face. <laughs> Any of our biometric systems um, for GDPR purposes, whether that's fingerprint recognition or uh, retinal or, or facial, you don't actually store the raw data of your, your personal information. So it all gets converted into um, like an algorithmic number as an identifier. So um, in most cases, we don't actually store I don't think of a single case where we actually store their face other than if you've got a CCTV system and we're using facial recognition as well, the CCTV element will obviously have stored their face on the recordings. But that was always the case. That was, that's what happens with the CCTV system. So if we then overlay that with some um, facial recognition to other things, um, we don't, we, we still, for that purpose, don't store any personal data, personally identifiable data. Um, so in, in that case, the, the, you know, the, the legal aspect of, of storing their personal face actually falls onto the CCTV process and the CCTV um, policy that they will have. Uh, and then our, our policy will be separate because we're not storing the face the CCTV system is. If it's a standalone system, we never, we never actually keep copies of their faces or, or biometric data. So. Okay, thanks, Mike. And Dorothy, I suppose this sort of moves on, on to your area there where Mike was talking about the legal elements. So um, if it's sort of health data and things like that that you're processing, how, where do you stand on the legal point in, in that sense? So if you're processing health data, that's going to be special category data. So you'd need to meet one of the lawful basis for processing that sort of data. Now, it depends how many people are involved. If, if you're processing um, really large numbers of um, data about individual, of a lot of people, then explicit consent isn't going to be easy to obtain. So you might want to rely on um, the substantial public interest condition or the public health basis under the GDPR, then if you do that, you also need to rely on a, an associated condition that's set out in the Data, data Protection Act. So it's actually, it, you just need to look through the legislation, both pieces of legislation, and make sure that you, you fall within the scope of the lawful basis. So it's, it, it takes a bit of time, but it's just important to do that analysis at the outset to make sure that you can process health data. Okay, that's good, thank you. Um, and we've just got, oh, go on. Sorry, I, I should just I should also add that um, another option would be to um, to depersonalize it. That that may be possible if you if you can remove the personal identifiers in some way, either by anonymizing the data or by adding um, some form of meaningless data. Or I should think, um, Mike and Andy, you're probably better placed to talk about how you can um, add noise to data in order to um, uh, reduce privacy issues. Yeah, I mean, oh, Andy's, you're, you're muted, Andy. You're muted, Andy. So you're right. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I was just going to say, actually, all, all of the work we do is on, um, I was trying to be polite, um, all, all of the work that, um, that we do actually is on um, data, which is um, where personal data is replaced by a pseudonym. Um, now, because we have to join up large amounts of data, which is another key focus for data protection law, because we have to join up lots of data from different sources, we, we use a pseudonym to do that, because then we can still relate data from one individual to another. But all of the work that we do is essentially on, um, on de-identified data. So we never know who the individual is, nor um, do we ever seek um, to take any action against that individual. So it is a case of basically working on de-identified data. That massively simplifies the problem. Um, and then there's one last question on here, um, which was again for me, which spoke about, it says, I spoke about the tax benefits um, from the use of a pattern. It says, is it available for, 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 I can't say the word, for the foreseeable future, or is there a time limit on how long a company can claim? So um, the patent box regime is here. It's, it's not going away as far as we're aware. Um, how you know, everything is all up in the air at the moment in terms of where budgets are going to sit going forward. So it might be that elements like that come away, although um, government incentives to try and get the UK developing and being innovative you would imagine that sort of thing would stay. Um, but in terms of the time limit in claiming, it just fits in with the corporation tax return again. So in essence, you've got 24 months after the period end to put that claim into the tax return. After that bit, you'd be timed out. So it's just a case of getting that, that at the same point. 
Rob, do you also just want to touch on that you might have a patent pending, so you might not be able to claim yet, but you can then lodge something and then make, make the actual claim later? Yeah, so when a patent is pending, you can, you can sort of pull the, um, the income or the savings on the, from patent box, and then when the patent is granted, you can then make that claim in that year. So you essentially collect the data while, while you're waiting for the patent to go through, and then, yeah, it's, um, it's all given relief in the year of grant. So it's quite good from that point of view. So if you, you don't necessarily need to make a claim as you're collecting, but certainly if you've got it there, then if it does get granted, you've, you've got the relief for the whole period. Okay, so I think in terms of questions, that's, that's all we've received in there. So hopefully that's answered everything for everyone. I'm just going to hand over to Dorothy, um, who's just going to give us a little bit of a close so if I just make you host Dorothy. There you go. Thank you. Thank you Rob. So um, I just want to say a, a few words to thank you Adrian and Rob for giving such a comprehensive summary on the use of AI in different sectors and um, particularly the availability of tax credits for these types of technologies is really interesting. And Mike and Andy the it was a fascinating insight on how you're using big data and predictive analytics as well as AI and security and surveillance. So it's really interesting to hear how this technology is being used. And um, thank you, thank you to our guests for, for attending. We'll be sharing a recording of this seminar. So if you've got any questions after the event, then please don't hesitate to contact us and we'll try and answer them. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Dorothy. It's been uh, been great. And I say, um, if if anyone else got any more questions, more than happy to um to speak offline. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Cheerio. Thank